All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to KCP Community Meeting, March eighth, twenty twenty two. We have a number of items on the agenda, and as I said before, let me know uh, if there's more. Feel free to add them. Um, Stefan, I guess you have you have the first few, if you want to give. Yeah, I can give Paul the first section. Oh, sure. We can talk about before, so I prepare everything. Yeah, this oh. won't this won't take long at all. I just wanted to make sure people were aware that we've got a little empty section for P4 brainstorming. P3 is expected to end on March 18th, so now's a good time where if you have requirements or priorities that you want to jot down for us, uh, put them in that document, and we will probably start discussing it in detail in the next community call. And I will make sure to add that topic for next week's agenda. Talk about this more. Thanks. Yeah. Is there, while we're on the topic, does anybody have anything uh, burning a hole in their mind about uh, prototyping in the next, in the next phase? All right. You have a week to think of something. <laughs> All right. Um, Let's go back yeah. to this one. Let me share one second. So I just want to briefly show something many have seen already. Um, a couple of PRs have merged. So a couple of people were involved. Um, org workspaces, root workspaces are a thing. Um, there's a PR for the demo script, Prototype 2. I think it's nearly done. I haven't seen it merged. I think Joachim is working on that. Anyway, so um, lots lots of things have changed. If you if you um, use the current main branch, um, basically we don't have, we still have a system admin. Um, can you see that? No, you can't. Right? Can you? I think you can see. Okay. Um, so uh, very briefly, um, what has changed? If you go to the admin cube config looks like that has a couple couple of contexts um, most of them are not so interesting so cross cluster is nothing you will use as a user uh, as administrator you will start in something called the uh, uh, current context is default which points if we do default where is it that system default to my knowledge so you land in some organization which is pre-created pre called Default, so it's always there. Um, there's a root workspace where you can see organizations we see in a second. And you can jump around between workspaces using um, the CLI plugin, the kubecutter plugin. So David updated it, uh, the PR merged yesterday or something. So um, the plugin should work again. There are still some small things we have to, to rule out, but basically it works. And um, what you can do. We start as a default, as I said, you can jump, you can do everything you want, like creating namespaces, and then you can jump to the root workspace, which is a very special, unique singleton uh, workspace. And if you look there, what is there? Cluster workspaces, there's just the default. The default, which is pre-created. Pre but of course you can create your own um, organizations there. So just um, take some cluster workspace, name demo, type is organization, that's important. And you can create this thing. And then you have a new, uh, a new organization called Demo. And you can use uh, the plugin we have as before. So you can say KCP workspace, use Demo. And then you land in your new organization. It's not a cluster workspace, which is meant for applications. So not everything is in there. So you won't find the workload cluster object, for example. So you cannot run applications easily by using the syncer. So for that, you have to do one more step and you have to um, basically uh, ACP workspace and create a, a, yeah, just another one. So we say, I hope I get the syntax right. Create um, meeting, just the name. Just the name, no, it's create, was correct. And you can say use meeting, and now you are in the actual, yeah, basically end user 
um, workspace. And if you see which resources are there, there's also workload cluster. So from this point on, you can basically start to do whatever you did in the past. Um, system admin, as I said, it's still there. It's a workspace, which is basically the empty string um, cluster name workspace, but it's not used anymore for anything a user should do. There is a bootstrap policy uh, for RBAC inside that's the only use, I think, which is uh, important at the moment. But other than that, basically everything starts from root. Root is the important one. There are, uh, in, in root, there are all um, the orgs, and in orgs, there are all the workspaces for users. All right. Um, that's, I think, everything I want to show. Very cool. Love it. <laughs> Ship it. Uh, any I think any questions or, or comments about what we're seeing? I'll add one quick comment. Uh, if you're playing around with RBAC, creating cluster roles and cluster role bindings, and you're confused why things aren't working in the org or workspace that you are fiddling with, make sure that you're not creating them in the, the default system admin context because that is not looked at and evaluated. So um, my example, I was trying to create stuff in root and forgot to set it to root. And so it was not finding the bindings like I expected it to. There's a uh, there's a shell uh, plugin that I have used in the past that shows you your current uh, kube context, like cluster name and and uh, those things. Uh, this makes me want, Andy, your comment makes me want there to be another level of that for which workspace you're currently in, which, you know, because, um, yeah, e even just within a cluster, it's very easy to accidentally be in the wrong namespace, be in the wrong context. Yeah. yeah and, and by I, the I way, we should try and encourage, um, like, folks to use one and find one that that works well with or with root orgs and workspaces. Yeah. David, you were saying something? No, I was just saying that uh, in the kubectl plugin, you have the current um, com sub command, where if it's a context that corresponds to a workspace or organization or um, a real workspace, then it will answer. And if it's not, then it will just answer that it's not a workspace context, in which case you can just do kubectl, you know, current context, config current context. Yeah, I think we have I, I think we have all the all the pieces that are needed for a mm. you know PS1 that shows you your current workspace and what org it's in and everything. Yeah, yeah, sure. You need to glue it all together. Um, yeah, it's hard enough to get lost when there's two levels and we're adding like three more levels. <laughs> so um, but no, but this is great and and uh, you know more levels to get lost in is a good thing, actually. Um, did you, you also uh, had, let me present again. You also had an item for issues yeah. without a milestone. Did you want to go through that or do you want to do that? Uh, um, let me just do the short out. It's just belonging sure. to the previous one. Um, there's a doc oh. if you want to read about the ABAC topic that Andy just mentioned. Um, just read through it. We are open for comments. This is a plan. It's not implemented. So um, Andy and or David mainly, he's doing a partial implementation at the moment. Uh, but this is a full thing we have in mind. So everybody who wants to know about policies and how we can define policies for other types of workspaces, that's a plan in the stock comments. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Have have we have we at any point reached out to like SIG multi tenancy or SIG multi cluster to just I mean not like to change what they're doing but just sort of to give them an idea of what we're doing and how it might this this reminds me a lot of uh, hierarchical namespaces in SIG multi tenancy um, but you know just actual more actual more levels instead of uh, yeah more levels. And, and inverting it, right? Like the yeah. problem with hierarchical namespace controllers is none of the primitives in cube are ever going to make hierarchical namespace work efficiently. And mm -hmm. so we're we're kind of like we have the option to make things work more efficiently. This, if you looked at what it would take to do hierarchical namespaces 
actually in cube, it would look a lot like the things we're talking about here, except a namespace can't change the API boundary and yeah. workspaces can. And that's actually almost more important for safety than, than, um, uh, than hierarchical, than namespaces are. Like a namespace isn't a boundary for safety or tenancy, it's a boundary for names, which is a part of the story, but just not the whole part. Hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't, uh, uh, it sounds like everything we're doing is basically not everything we're doing is, um, making hierarchical namespaces, but for real, like to actually make them a, a, a safety boundary and not just a name boundary and to, you know, hack apart Kubernetes to make it possible. Uh, anyway, I think, I think it, they might be interested to, I don't know when they meet or, you know, whatever, but we can and, and also, yeah, that. like there's the, uh, hierarchy assumes that every level is the same one of the key points i think that like even stefan and andy what you guys are doing is like you don't necessarily have the same hierarchy you have like a you might have a policy hierarchy that's different than your quota hierarchy and you might have an organizational hierarchy that's different from your team hierarchy like yeah. and that's like where instead of just one type of hierarchy we're trying to say like you can you can hide it behind an interface and bring the right abstractions for each problem domain, but they can't diverge too much or people won't understand it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool. Anything else uh, uh, on anyone's mind on this topic? Going once. All right. Um, thank you. Do we want to go back to presenting things? Is that showing up? No. No? There it is. Yeah, it says it's there. Okay. Uh, just taking its time. Um, yeah, I, uh, I think we'll, we'll maybe do milestones and issue stuff uh with the time remaining i think we'll have time at the end um our back policy use case for organization type right um andy did you want to talk about api bindings yeah just real quick an up status update uh i've started opening up uh, one or two pull requests and there'll be more coming. So if you remember the API inheritance from prototype two, where you could go into a workspace and set inherit from on the spec and point to some other workspace, that is going to go away and be replaced by the API exports and bindings that we've been brainstorming and designing for a while. And uh, on my laptop, what I was able to do was rip out inherit from, replace it with API bindings. I um, basically pulled a CRD schema from uh, one of the kind clusters. I think I tested with endpoints from Core V1. I converted it to an API resource schema, which is basically our way of defining a CRD without it being an actual CRD that users can create instances of. Uh, so I created that API resource schema. I created an API export for it in some workspace. I created another workspace and did an API binding. So this was testing cross workspace binding. And I modified the uh, CRD code so that it actually would populate discovery and um, handle your requests correctly. And I was able to get uh, an API bound into a workspace, just like the API, API inheritance demo showed before, but this is with the new um, the new designs. So I'll be continuing to work on that this week. Awesome. Uh, oh, Steve has added a, a late breaking item. Oh, and there's more. Oh my goodness, coming so fast. Uh, Steve, you want to talk about Cockroach as a backing store? Uh, so there's a, so I, I think I've mostly validated the idea that we can use it as a drop-in replacement. Um, everything seems to be totally functional. We're passing all the unit integration tests. Uh, I'm still currently wading through all of the things we broke with our 
a year of hacks on our fork. <laughs> I never bothered to validate. Um, so actually running E to E is proving to be a bit tricky, but we're getting really close. Um, but yeah, hopefully this week we'll be able to validate uh, E to E. Um, it's, I guess I was expecting a little bit more of the, the baseline like API semantics to be validated at a less complex level, but I think all of the important like I can actually use watch sort of tests happen in EDE and only there. Um, yeah, and then I think we should probably reconsider what the next steps are to figure out like are we are we fo like do we focus then on potentially figuring out like good deployment topologies and doing some sort of stress test on it to figure out the performance characteristics or like is yeah, wh where is the endpoint? I think is a little bit hazy to me. So can I ask some stupid questions? Um, yep. I, you know, haven't been intimately involved here, so I'm basically lost. Um, so when you talk about using um, a cockroach, you know, it raises a couple of big questions, right? One is the API service has this watch cache that grows with the, you know, volume of addressable data. Are you turning that off or, or letting it grow? The other question I have is the Kube API has this MVCC semantics through the resource version. Um, you know, in particular, every change in the data produces a new resource version. Uh, are you really getting that uh, through Cockroach and how? Yeah, so uh, as far as the watch cache, um, one of the reasons we're looking at Cockroach in the first place is the implications of the watch cache and then underneath it, the implications of etcd having to store everything in uh, in memory for it to be functional, uh, they, those are uh, that that presents scaling problems for everyone. Um, and so the idea with Cockroach is, can we uh, get past some of those scaling problems by using a different store that has different semantics and doesn't need to hold as much in memory? Um, so the watch cache is off, and we expect if we implement a watch cache and we need one, we'll probably have it at a different layer, uh, just based on how some of the lower level functionality works with Cockroach. Um, and then, yeah, with resource version and whatnot, um, Cockroach specifically was chosen because it supports that. Uh, so uh, I'll well, try wait to... a minute, wait a minute. Cockroach doesn't directly support that. It doesn't have resource version, right? Yeah, it does. Cockroach has. Yeah. Steve is Steve is validated, and we're 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 we have Cockroach has effectively all of the semantics that offer an equivalent to the core semantics that we depend on in cube. That's right, an right. equivalent. So they don't use the word resource version. So are you referring to the, the server timestamps uh, from the, the time traveling feature? We are using the hybrid logical clock, yes. Yeah, the hybrid logical clock is a totally ordered, um, uh, totally ordered per resource type effective uh, resource version because that is the part of the serializable that guarantees that Cockroach offers. And we still have to validate all of the implications of it. Like I'd probably say we're 99% sure at this point that we can offer all those semantics, but we still have to, as Steve noted, completely validate it. All right, thank you. Yeah, so like one of the, you know, there's, there's obviously some gotchas. Um, for instance, the hybrid logical clock you know, is l larger than one 64-bit integer. Uh, and so there's a little bit of hackery going on in terms of right now I'm still uh, collapsing everything into one 64-bit int, so we don't change the surface of resource version to users. Um, you know, those are sorts of things that we were talking about even before we were looking at Cockroach and, and trying to figure out uh, where that sort of thing. Well, of course, users are not supposed to be parsing resource version as a 64-bit integer. Yeah. The, Downside is a lot of them are, and there's actually quite a lot of places even in the core cube code base where that happens. So I, I think with KCP, if we break that, um, it would be unpleasant. So the hope is we wouldn't need to. And there's two prongs is that there are community-wide changes that would slowly move people away from that, that would unlock it, but the pragmatic of how do you meet people where they are today? As Steve's noting, so you have to you have to both you have to take both of those, but they're two separate prongs. We would fix we would find out ways of doing this in the ecosystem, which you know we've done it once or twice in API machinery. We've taken baby steps towards it. We would potentially look at what we would do to correct this and make sure that whatever is necessary, we would support in the future. Stefan, you yes, I understand. 
Right, yes. Uh, I'm dismayed to hear that there's a lot of violations, but yeah, that clearly implies a two-pronged approach. Yeah, generally, Mike, the, what, what I found in, when I was looking at it, like the, the, the number one most common place where users are currently parsing resource version is when they have uh, an outgoing mutation cache and they want to know, has my object changed uh, since I last updated it? And then they haven't implemented a generation. Um, so they're using resource version as a hypersensitive generation effectively where it changes on every update. Um, I, th I think in most cases that could be uh, replaced with a generation that captures like the semantically meaningful bits. Um, but yeah, it, it would take some time. So in, uh, I, I think you're alluding there through the kind of two categories of, uh, as you say, users here or clients, right? There are the, some particular controllers, and then there's the generic uh, client uh, libraries, right? The latter is more, more disturbing, right? We, we can address or have use cases that don't use certain controllers, uh, but if there's parsing in client libraries, you know, that's that's bad for everybody immediately. Yeah, and, and I think the, the other thing with just the ecosystem, like I think I wouldn't be surprised if someone using some strongly typed language somewhere has a cube client that they've written that like explicitly parses the resource version field into an integer. Um, and it would be ideal not to have their thing fail to run, even if they're not using it as an integer. Like, yeah, well, I mean, you know, there's uh, always the problem of, you know, there's the source we can see in tree and then there's all the source that we can't see, right? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's just no hope of, uh, you know, enforcing the desired discipline on on source we can't see, uh, you know, apart from getting all the source that we can see uh, to follow the discipline and, you know, give lots of warning and, and flip a switch and, you know, people that break the rules uh, suffer the consequences. Well, and, and that's partially why we're doing this in KCP. Like, I want to be really clear here, like the advantage here is with KCP is that we're going after workloads and use cases that potentially are much larger than cube even though initial uses wouldn't. That gives us a plausible mechanism to have a reduced set of constraints that still satisfy most clients and to specifically test the, the hypothesis, which is, you know, of course, like, oh man, I really want to go to KCP. Oh, there, I can't parse the resource version. Okay, well, here's how what I do to fix it. Oh, okay, now I know I've fixed it. That then gives us a better, that's like the two leg part as well, which is like, we can fix in tree, we can have a really compelling reason to make this change and then we can go individually work with teams as you said uh, like having like the switch and like what's a rollout plan um, we were going to have to think about this anyway but knowing what semantics the world needs is what we can't be confident of we steve has a pretty comprehensive list that i think stevan you also helped with as well like here are the semantics we think that we offer to clients of cube we've never actually done that exercise in cube and so that's a document that would be like do we actually provide these semantics or not? Um, can we tell whether we support them or not? That's a, com a larger community discussion as well. I think I followed most of what you said, uh, but I got lost when you're talking about the semantics we provide, right? Because today it is a 64-bit integer and we have no bounds on, you know, what client code is making use of any details of that. Uh, I mean, I mean, in I mean, in practice, what are the effective scale? Like we, we do not allow you to do that. It's just you can do that. So the intent to provide, and we've said things like, well, you know, we have this abstraction. What are we formally supporting? Formal support comes from the project out. And then the reaction is we don't want to just break people. That's the balance. And so defining what we actually formally support in terms of what actual workloads need. If someone's parsing the resource version for a stupid reason, they don't need that. If they're parsing it for a very good reason that we have not captured, which is like one of them is um, ordering of resource versions so that you can reason about when you dispatch a write to the server, when you've seen that write, we don't actually support that very well in cube and our published semantics don't support it. If we were to commit to supporting it, what changes would we need to preserve in the next version of resource version? Would the next, what would be the evolution of that that supports the semantic we need? That's the key point is we are, why are people parsing resource version is very important to understand before we change parsing resource version. Okay, that makes sense to me. Right. Today, we don't offer any semantics other than, you know, well, actually, whatever you can do with the string. But if you read the docs, right, the, the official 
alleged semantics equality, is you can only equality, yeah, equality compare. And also compare with zero and compare with empty string. Those are two special values that get called out. But apart from that, comparing for equality. And I totally agree. I think it would be great to identify a an abstraction that says what's what we support. And I think you you put your finger on exactly the important one, right? Ordering. If we can get ordering, you know, I, I think that's a huge leg up. I mean, I've tried to write, I've written controllers that follow yeah. the only equality, and it's a real pain in the ass. I have to do a lot of work because I can't do ordering. If I could do ordering, it would, my controllers would get a lot easier to write correctly. Um, so I'd be, you know, I think that makes a, a lot of sense. Yeah. So I'm sure there's a lot more on this topic we uh, we can and undoubtedly will go into. I want to make sure uh, Stefan has had his hand up for a little while. Yeah, I wanted to quickly talk about next steps, Steve's question. Um, I, I think I, I asked Steve in private already, um, and Mike also mentioned that watch cache. If this is disabled, we lose performance on things like label selectors, I guess, these kind of things, which are not in memory anymore, but need I mean, they, they will scale linearly with the database size. Which high cardinality filtering is bad. So any yeah. scenario where you've taken a lot of data and filter it down would theoretically be bad, although that's just, we're losing performance over a workload we don't support today, which is the primary yeah, okay. cube is nodes selecting by field name and a few label selection queries that people do at scale. So my, my question is, um, I see two next steps or two directions. One is basically to, to do research in index support of some kind from Cockroach. So changing the storage stack in a way that those things get faster again. And the other direction is basically to have partitioning. So again, have a watch cache probably, but have partitioning, but of, of course, just one database below. Maybe things like movement will be trivial this way, but um, we resemble lots of the etcd architecture with multiple etcds and sharding and so on. And I would like to hear, do we see value in the second? Is this possible? Do we know that? Like partitioning in the sense that we assign workspaces still to shards and each shard will have a watch cache for its workspaces, but all against the same cockroach. Watch cache, I would honestly say that watch cache is a very, very, very targeted solution to a very specific set of general problems. And the alternative is watch cache was intended to mitigate etcd watch performance on an earlier version of etcd. That is why it exists in Kube today. We have continued down that path by making small incremental improvements to it. It is, there is a fundamental, I, I think we would, but maybe Stefan, another way, of, I would say what we're trying to do is reframe our access pattern in terms of efficiency. The list of access patterns we have is different than cube today. But if no one can say how much they need a hike, like the sinker is probably the worst of the high cardinality filtering. We already know that. Um, I would say we should be designing to have the right set of trade-offs. If Cockroach is bad at watch, that's a reason to have things like a watch cache. But I don't know that the solution state should just be assumed. Like, I, I think we should jump to, we will hold things in memory for specific patterns from clients, no matter what. Controllers will hold things in memory. That's how reconciling controllers work. Their working set is defined by the largest machine they can run on. But the other stuff is open. Like, we might actually say, Partitioning is maybe like I'm I'm really worried about about being too myopic on the partitioning discussion just because the access patterns there's there's only a handful of access patterns that we actually have to support because the clients are still basically trying to read and hold everything in memory. It's I'd also say I think like there's there's a fairly reasonable way to like plumb a bunch of data through to the storage layer that doesn't actually change the interface and some of that data is already available anyway so i i, I would wonder it, it might be a mistake to not use sql when we have sql and i wonder if indexing and like intelligent queries can make some of those like much faster yeah we have some of that like, metadata available yeah, yeah, like if you can get those to work we can have partitioning right it, 
And honestly, and we, there's, operation, right. there's operational characteristics of partitioning too, right? Having a single cockroach under a global control plane may not actually satisfy data resiliency, data privacy, and data separation or failure mode isolation. That's the, okay, we may still need a way to query across multiple workspaces, across multiple servers. But then, Stefan, your other point, though, of the access pattern, the data, how we make it efficient, in-memory caches are best when you have a limited domain. A workspace is a better, a workspace is implicitly a better in-memory thing than this set of resources across multiple workspaces. The same way in Cube, a namespace is a better, like if you only need a subset of things, a single resource or a namespace is better for the set of things to hold in memory than everything in the cluster. But I think we're already saying we will have scale dimensions outside of memory for resource types. We know that we're more likely to hit that. Cube was always designed that everything in Cube could be held in memory at least five times in on multiple servers. And so like, I don't know that that design constraint is still there. So we have to be really careful about it too. So my, uh, this is amazing. This is fantastic and I love it. And I wanna start telling people about it because I think this is an example of something that like a science project that KCP has done for KCP's purposes that may be very interesting to the broader ecosystem and community of folks. Like the number of people who, who cared about uh, uh, Kubernetes being able to run on SQLite, like just that and, and a different dimension, right? I, I want to tell people about this, but I don't want to pass tell them EDE. until you're ready. <laughs> Sorry? Let's pass some EDE first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I, I guess what I'm getting at is like, uh, when what do we need to satisfy before we can start saying that this works more loudly than in this meeting? Uh, also, there was a comment about like, and a lot of the discussion we're having is like, what does this solve? What problem does this practically solve? Um, what problems doesn't it practically solve to Clayton's point about like data residency and latency to the client and stuff like, like those things, it will not completely solve that, but it will give a new set of tools to people who are interested in that. And I guess I want to, push on us to have those answers so we can share and say like, look at this cool thing that Steve has done. I think that the, the data, um, the, the scale one is, is a pretty easy sell. Um, and then the, the resident set <laughs> size is a pretty easy sell. Um, but yeah, let's, let's pass the API machinery end to end tests. Um, and then I have a, you know, a kind, like a local kind setup that anyone could use with enough hacks to try it out, which would be I, cool. I also want to caution, so just like so that folks are aware, um, there was a discussion uh, going on in steering where there's concerns about etcd being effectively unmaintained, uh, just because of like difficulty and um, you know people moving on from their roles in the etcd community. Um, and so there's a separate discussion that's going to be happening at the same time. I would be very, we, we very, very much don't want to describe this as we're doing this because we don't want to support etcd. Um, that is a completely orthogonal thing. Like uh, most of the folks involved have no intention of using this as a, as a solution to that problem. Um, this is more about opening up uh, scale options. But if it is asked, I think people should just say like, hey, like Steve, if you get asked or if anybody here hears this, like, no, this doesn't replace etcd um, because that would like, that's a, that's gonna break community. This is uh, opening up options. It might have re relevance for that in the future, but we're not, that's not what it's there for today, so. Uh, one other question, Steve. Um, Cockroach has, um, you know, like an enterprise tier and a free tier, right? Are you using enterprise features or are you only using free features? Uh, that's a really good question. There's certainly a number of things that the enterprise tier makes a little bit easier, but everything's available in the free tier. So I'm not using anything that's enterprise right now. Steve, we should put Thank that you. in the um, design document as well. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. really important. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think uh, like Clayton, to your point about how we how we position this vis-a-vis -vis etcd, I think it's, there's precedent already, right? Like Kine is a different etcd replacement, no, replacement is already a loaded word, but a, a different option for not using etcd, which has, which is interesting because it has different scale and maintainability and whatever characteristics. We're just coming up with the third one of those that has different, you know, 
uh, some good, some bad characteristics. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, thank you for that context. That's useful to know in the general sense so that we don't step on a, a beehive or something. Um, but yeah, I think, I think, and, and I don't think we've even committed to using it ourselves, right? Like we're not even sure we want it, but at least we've gotten it to the point, Steve's gotten it to the point that it's like plausible that it could work, uh, which I think is super exciting. So yeah, again, one basic stupid question here. Um, you know, I, I've also seen that there's talk about um, sharding uh, the KCP servers. So would the idea be that every shard talks to the same cockroach? or each shard talks to its own cockroach. That's the issue we were bringing up before around if we have operational, if if all if everybody talks to the same cockroach and an admin fat fingers drop table, um, then you know we don't have operational resilience. Um, a key part of a control plane is um, understanding where those requirements would be. So it's possible that uh, no, we would anticipate there being either, you know, you can set up a hierarchy of control planes that have different APIs and different use cases and different audiences. I think there's also a use case, which the first proposal and what we did some of the initial evaluation of using lots of etcd shards as a concrete hard partition boundary. Um, I think we're still exploring that. So I don't think we've settled up. We, we haven't settled on the exact requirements that you need, that we believe that a global control plane would need because we don't understand all of the use cases that would lead someone to like a uh, very concrete example. If you're a large enterprise, you're deploying stuff on multiple clouds and you want a control plane, you're a little bit worried about blast radius if someone compromises that data store and gets access to write access that could change everything in every cloud. You may wish to have actually very hard physical boundaries between parts of your control plane. You might have a security and policy control plane and you might have an application control plane or multiple application control planes. One cockroach for all of those control planes may not be desirable, but it could be that, yeah, your app control plane could scale horizontally. Um, you might have regional app control planes, but it would be nice if you didn't have to actually think about regional control planes. You could just say, hey, I want these characteristics and you could use the existing control. Plane. We're just not there yet um, in terms of understanding all the requirements. Thank so, you. Door stays yeah, open. Like it doesn't solve every possible problem. Unfortunately, no one has yet. I mean, it should. Let's problems. be honest, Jason. We all want it to solve all problems. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. No, that'd be great. Unfortunately, that's those stupid, fat-fingered humans that are the real problem. Uh, so when Skynet comes along and, and takes care of that, we'll be fine. But until then. Um, uh, anyway, yeah. I guess, uh, uh, Steve, I will also mention that I think the CFP for KubeCon in October is opening at the end of March. Uh, so I think this would be a very interesting, very timely uh, topic for that. Uh, yeah, I'm, that I'm not going to volunteer you for it, but I am going to volunteer you for it. <laughs> um, we have, I think there was one more, unless, I mean, we can talk about cockroach more. You still have 20 more minutes. Um, but there was one more thing I think Stefan added. Um, let me, let me yeah, this. Addition, in addition to, to Andy's topic, um, we have an... Uh, pretty minimal API at the moment, which is merged in main. And um, that's what Andy is implementing, API bindings, API, uh, API exports. There's nothing advanced yet in main about evolution and checking of API changes, like is this breaking if you remove a field, something like that. Mm. That's all in this PR. So if you want to take a look, um, this is basically the future, the value adds on top of API bindings, which CRDs don't have. Like you can create schemas, which are basically snapshots of CRDs. And the system will tell you when you do something bad, which is potentially breaking clients. You can override, like you can you can acknowledge certain things, like when you add a set of sub resource, it's breaking, we know that. But maybe it's something a user, or not a user, but a CID author wants. And you can say, yes, this is something I, I know it's happening. I accept that. And I want to hold it out, basically. This is a, a pattern in this um, API proposal that you can, you get warnings, you get rejections, actually. Admission will do those checks against API resource schemas, but you can override. And potentially in the future, you can maybe migrate or 
uh, have different ways to solve problems of API um, evolution. So shout out, um, please take a look, read that, um, give comments, ideas, everything that is missing in CRDs today, which you would love to have. This is a chance to add it. Awesome. That is that is also a topic that I want to watch a KubeCon talk about. Uh, so we should, uh, I think it's interesting that we are solving all the problems or doing all the features in CRDs that we wish we had, and we're doing it using CRDs effectively, right? Like we are building the layer on top of CRDs on top of CRDs. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, Carlos, you have your hand up. I don't know if this was about uh, this topic or the last one or another one. It was for the code uh topic. Uh, so I have a question on will the database be blocked for a single cluster or being the regular SQL database, can that be accessed and modified by another uh, resource manager? Define resource manager in this case, like you want to run workloads that also leverage that same database? Yeah, so my use case uh, is mostly academia, and we have been having this question and conversation over the past year, mostly, on the what if I can have Kubernetes running alongside with academia resource managers, but uh, being then able to be friends, right? Like, hey, I'm using this node. Okay, I will leave it to you. Oh, I'm using this, like, having a, a single state manager where they can communicate. Right, like I'm using this resource, uh, leave it to me, and and things like that, and and this really sounds like a solution for that conversation I've been hearing over the past few months, really, not even a year. So there's there's a couple of things, which is I think that would be nice, a nice property to have that if you had control plane like semantics that were implemented in systems that needed a SQL store and that the SQL store semantics were reasonably consistent with your investments that you already made, right? Because SQL stores aren't the same. And Cockroach actually is different than, even though it offers a Postgres interface, there are implications of the client behavior that are fundamental to Cockroach because of the way that transactions are handled, where retriable transactions are an expectation that no other SQL system even really thinks about because there is no such thing as you know having to deal with retry in most existing SQL store, uh, stores. So if the workload could benefit from having a SQL store that was close to the control plane, I think there's things to think about. Cockroach certainly offers the ability to break up and move that data around so that, you know, just the, the fact that you have two tenants on the same database doesn't necessarily mean that tenant A or tenant B even have to be co-located. However, there is a trust domain, which is giving someone even the limited set of SQL rights to write alongside that store might impact the security mental model of that. And so it, it's not that that's a, a hard blocker, it would just be a point of caution, but I do think it's much closer than you would say. Like you wouldn't recommend that someone reuse the core cluster etcd today, except for like things that are shipped and supported by the same teams and have you know that you could reason about both of them you wouldn't necessarily open that up to end users i think there'll be a similarity to that but i also think there's a door potentially and this is something that cockroach has shown with their multi-tenant layer on top which isn't open sourced at this point but might actually be amenable if you know there's enough interest would be some of those kinds of separations actually potentially could lead to the idea that you could co-locate control plane control plane like and data plane like capabilities we just i don't think we're ready to to know so i, I think it's a worth exploring and 10 15 per 20 percent chance that it turns out to be a really bad idea for some reason we haven't figured out yet but could be a very very good idea that could be a huge benefit for not just academic systems but actual like if you have a control plane and that control plane is already a single point of failure for your entire enterprise um, you know, what are the kinds of ways that you can leverage and benefit from that? Um, for instance, for like security and access control and authorization, if you compromise an IAM solution in a company, you have compromised the entire company. Um, what are the ways that we can break those up, but maybe we can concentrate them and get other operational benefits for teams, which is something Kubernetes did. So I think the answer is maybe. And 
this is a great follow-up topic that we should put in the database design as a sub thread that we don't lose track of. Um, so maybe that's something we can add to that design doc. Um, is it, did we, did we share that with KCP dev yet, Steve? Okay, I'll, I'll share that with KCP dev and then I'll create some subsections in it, Carlos, so that we can add some of those notes and some of the things that other folks discussed. It's still very work and draft. Most of Steve's advances have not been captured as he's learned stuff and we'll, We'll say like, okay, we'll we'll turn this back into the doc so we can get the positioning right. Cool. Thank you. Um. Yeah. Uh. Uh. Before we move on, does anyone have any uh, questions or comments about uh, the future of API evolution? Because I think that's a very interesting area of topic. <laughs> Um, but otherwise, yeah, take a look at the, at the PR, poke around, see if, uh, see what you think about it. Um, all right. We have about 12 minutes left, uh, and no one, oh, thank you for filing an issue on that. Um, uh, do you want to go over issues filed since last week? Why did I open that in a new tab? That's perfect. Um, oh. um, yeah, I guess we can go through uh, test flake. Andy, did you have uh, ideas about this? I saw in the Slack that you mentioned. Not really, just some sort of slowness or race somewhere. Weirdness, yeah. Um, I We have somebody who's going to work on it. So, oh, okay. um, cool. Now, now that they commented, I can probably assign them. Uh, nice. I like severity time bomb. I haven't seen that one before. There's another one. Oh no. Um, KCP admin can create resources in workspaces that don't exist. Um. That seems that seems is like this, is this that don't exist or it's, logical clusters that don't exist. That's intention. Yeah, it's intentional. A real admin does not go through authorization. And, and logical authorization clusters, is yeah, like authorization no is a is a place where this is checked. That the workspace existence is checked in authorization. Yeah. And, and so an authorization is not applied to admins. A logical yeah. cluster is something without any persistent, without any definition. Um, it's just there. If you use it, it exists. That's a, the goal of a logical cluster. Stefan, um, can, is there an admin action that can delete all things inside a non-existent, a, a logic, an arbitrary logical cluster? Uh, at the moment, there is not. Okay. Yeah, as as, I, I think it's reasonable. I mean, to, to preserve this as long as there's the ability to go and see what's you there. Can do, I think you can do the lead collection should work probably as an admin, obviously. Well, but you, you'd end up needing like, you need to know what's there. If it's not a workspace and it doesn't have discovery and you don't know the types, it might be yeah. difficult to do that. But I think this there's is one no of the discovery. where having some storage support would be useful. I mean, Regardless. honestly, as long as, a right as long as there's a way to list logical clusters from an admin context that may actually be an out for us which is anything in it if you could it may be that there's just another semantic we can use that's not the regular cube delete but acts like it like a virtual workspace available to a root admin that allows them to see all things across all child workspaces and delete them potentially or to create a virtual workspace that maps to a logical cluster that does magic discovery on the store level, those could be some options. Maybe it's a very easy option, and this is a good first buck for somebody. We have um, the convention that system colon is a prefix for local, um, as I, I, mean, I mean, for workspaces which are local and just for this chart, and they are never accessible to some, some normal user. So we could change the authorizer that he edit for some way that we check if it's a system colon workspace we we will allow that if it's not system colon we will still reject even an admin 
I think we'd be one I'm really sure that that's how we wanted to separate logical clusters and storage though. I mean, it, it's kind of interesting because like, yeah, the colon makes sense for workspace names. Would we ever want to map, would we ever want to use that colon to do composition of keys, for instance? Like, would we ever potentially have a workspace naming scheme that's not dot separated or follows a different set of rules? Like logical clusters might need to think about that, whereas workspaces are mapping onto that system. So it could be that we, yeah, we reserve colon. Um, no, we did, we did, that's the moment. Yeah. Basically, it's a, it's a separator. Uh, also, you could reserve the first colon for one purpose and leave the rest of the yeah. string open. Yeah. yeah. Um, Andy has his hand up. Yeah, I was wondering, do we need to add a mechanism to track unique logical cluster names for the potential of identifying them, deleting things, and so on. I mean, right now, they exist implicitly and when would, keys get put underneath, where's, right? Where's the value of identifying or making or enforcing uniqueness? Is that well, just a system use, chart use, local usage? I, I was thinking like if we needed to say for for whatever use case, give me a list of all logical clusters or I know I need to go delete or like, let me go find these logical clusters so that I can go delete some things that need to get deleted. Yeah. We don't currently have a way of registering and tracking logical cluster names. And the only way that I can think of to do that would be getting in the handler chain and tracking it that way. But my question is like, do we want to do that? I, at some level, all rights to the store need to happen on a resource schema. So at a minimum, a resource schema needs to have existed to create a resource. And with the current store structure we have anyway, a workspace delete call is just verifying that you can perform a delete across all of the valid resource schemas. There is a question is if there is a delete that just allows you to say for all of all a delete works might be another option. Like it could be that there's just a way to represent this as a normal resource of type etcd key or you know uh, tuple of schema, workspace name, namespace, and value, and that the delete call actually just operates over that. So the discovery is there's only one type of resource, and you can do like a field selector on the resource schema type or something, or the workspace schema type. That would be another option. If uh, when we create a workspace, does that delete stuff that happens to already be there before the workspace is there? Steve no. is saying no. No. Okay. So no, like that that sounds like a security problem to me, right? Like if I can sneak in and it put is. something in Andy's workspace before he creates it, then when unless you're an admin, in which case that's a feature because you can sure. ensure yeah, yeah. that. <laughs> and so like I think this is a use case driven problem too. Is like we're not really crisp on the use cases we need. And we want to have a generic thing that's not so generic that we spend all our time on genericism, but we want to concretely solve like a really key problem. This key problem, I think, basically comes down to the thing you raised, Jason, which is uh, if an admin creates a resource in a namespace that doesn't exist in a workspace or a workspace that doesn't exist and then a workspace is created, is that a bug or a feature? Mm -hmm. An admin could go delete the database or tweak etcd so it's not really a, a key challenge but then the other one i think is the how would you clean that up as an admin if somebody accidentally created a whole bunch of stuff in a, in a logical cluster that either you don't allow it or you give a person a way to recover from that and creating a workspace that you then can delete the stuff out of to then delete the workspace feels like the wrong approach if you have this lower level abstraction yeah uh andy go ahead yeah, I wanted to answer a question from Nick in chat about logical clusters versus workspaces. So there are like a logical cluster is just a an isolation in etcd of everything in that bucket. Uh, so think of it like a Kubernetes cluster. You can have CRDs, you can have namespaces, you can have PVs, like whatever you can put in that's cluster scoped or namespace scoped goes into a logical cluster. And uh, between two different logical clusters, there is isolation. So I can have a default namespace in logical cluster A, I can have a default namespace in logical cluster B, and the contents are completely independent and unique. 
the reason that we distinguish between logical clusters and workspaces is that we want to provide some additional functionality via the workspace concept, such as um, typing and inheritance and other functionalities. So I, I can give you a concrete example. So you could say, um, like, I work at Acme Corp and I'm going to provide a service to all my developers. And whenever they create a workspace, they're going to automatically get uh, widgets and tacked on and cert manager and all sorts of other things. And like that is codified in a workspace type along with API bindings and maybe some other things, which a lot of this is still in development, so it's visionary. But the idea is that uh, just creating a logical cluster or just storing stuff in a logical cluster doesn't give you any of that. It, it's basically like an empty Kubernetes cluster. And so the workspaces give us organizations and as a hierarchy and organizations contain workspaces and workspaces contain namespaces and then all of the um, the policy and defaulting that you get with with the type system. Thanks for the uh, the end up. Yeah, thank you. That was a that was a good uh, a good summary. Does that, that that did that answer your question? Did that give you more questions? It's okay either way. <laughs> uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Now I can. Yeah, I think it answered most of my questions. It's uh, one of the, the weird things is is, and I think that bug kind of shows it is that um, there's kind of two places to go when you're talking about uh, these logical clusters and I, I suppose like the the persona for the top level is really like um admins of like the super cluster or the 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 kcp server the aggregate of everything mm. um okay yeah I, I think so far the decision has been that admins can literally do everything and so they shouldn't be blocked from creating workspace or creating resources and workspaces that don't exist. Um, though that is confusing, as as evidenced by the fact that we are talking about it. Um, I, so created maybe... a, I created a thread in the in this in public Slack to chat about this specific topic, specifically related to this issue. So we can follow up there and then maybe bring that note back to six forty seven. Cool. Uh, someone was putting their hand up. Ale, I think. Did you did you have something on your mind? Yeah, when when Andy explained the differences. Sorry, I'm really new to the project, but a question that occurred to me was when a user uh, interacts with workplaces, workspaces, do they end up uh, creating resources in logical cluster? Um, if not, like what's the relationship between how that works? Yes. Yeah, so every workspace is backed, so to speak, by a single logical cluster. Um, it's not a detail that an end user necessarily needs to know. Um, they just need to know that they are working with a, a workspace. The workspace has a URL, and that uh, they can think of that like a, a Kubernetes API server. Yeah, that's a good yeah. question, though. Um, and I think a lot of that comes up a lot as like, what is the difference between these things and why? Um, uh, with that, I think we have uh, run out of time and made it through two of our issues. But uh, it was a good, good discussion today on a wide range of topics. So good work, everyone. Uh, and we'll see you next week. I'll try to get this recording up later today. See you, folks. Bye. Thanks. Bye.